Hello and welcome to THST Official, the famous home of the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust blog and podcast. And boy, do we have a special show for you this evening. My name is Martin Bahaja. I have to say that, guys, just so you know, we I actually had a message, somebody saying, you always introduce everyone on the show, you don't introduce yourself. So I was like, oh, that's very nice. So I said, okay, I'll introduce them, mainly because they don't know how to pronounce my surname. So my name's Martin Bahaja, and I'm joined by our regulars, as always, as we now refer to them, Rachel Martin, um, Rob White, and Anthula Achilleos. Good evening, all. Good evening. Hi. Hi. See you again. Now... Cast your mind back to January 10th. All was well. Spurs were third in the league. Seems like a long time ago. Um, we just won our Carabao Cup semi-final. And we were also still in the FA Cup, having beaten Marine Football Club. Now, forget all that's happened on the pitch since then. What we should remember is that it was the start of, hopefully, a very, very special relationship between Spurs fans and Marine. And we'll talk about the fantastic idea of virtual tickets and how well the sales went, the raffle and the very kind words of Marine Chairman Paul Leary towards Spurs fans. I think he called us the best fans in the world and we'll take that. Thank you very much. Um, and that's because we're actually joined by the football club's CEO, James Leary, this evening. Good evening, James. How are you? Hi, Martin. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I've got to say to you, James, I'll start by saying you are officially the first person to come on THST official who is not a board, who's not a THST official board member. Um, so you're speaking on this channel as the first outsider. So that's a major achievement. So congratulations. Um, that's a privilege, that. thank you. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're going to speak about um, you and your involvement with Marine and uh, how it's all been going and the, the great FA Cup experience in a bit. But what we wanted to do just before we, we get on to that is talk about our AGM, which happened last night. It's our first sort of virtual AGM. Um, and it was a great success. So, Anne, over to you to tell us a bit, bit about that. Yeah, I thought it was a really great experience last night. Um, I'm sure the rest of you agree with that as well. Um, I thought it went quite smoothly. Um, quite a lot of new, I want to say faces, but we didn't see the faces, but new people <laughs> that were able to um, log in remotely um, to join us. Um, and it just actually highlights um, one of the ways people have been using technology um, in a creative way to try and tackle the challenges that have been thrown at us through this pandemic. Um, from AGMs to birthdays, celebrations, theatre, art, quizzes, lots of quizzes. I think I'm, I'm a bit sick of quizzes, to be honest. Um, but yeah, and yeah, in all areas of life, uh, we found a way to be together and try and enjoy life as much as we can whilst in lockdown. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sam. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? A new way of working. Everyone's talking about it at work and, uh, and you know, organisations like us where, the future may well be more virtual meetings and using technology it's there for us even like now recording a podcast via teams and uh, and it works you know so it's uh, um here's to the future and the technology so thanks for that um we're going to get one thing out of the way aren't we rachel you, we, there was a certain tweet last week that you wanted to mention so we'll talk about that and then we'll then we'll carry on so go on over to you rage yeah i think it's always best to get these things out of the way first isn't it i mean we actually we actually had been talking about we wanted to invite you on james um, and then it sort of got bumped forward a little bit. Um, despite the year ending in a one, somehow Spurs managed to not win the FA Cup. Um, and after two hours of absolutely gruelling football at Everton, you know, we were ahead, we clawed our way back. It was absolutely, uh, you know, devastating, really. We lost. And, um, you know, I think we were all pre feeling pretty gutted. And I know that I'm sure the players were really exhausted two hours after you lose is very different to two hours after you win and uh, then there was a tweet from marine um now i'm sure that anybody who unlike me doesn't have a um, sense of humor bypass would have thought very funny very clever very creative um i i haven't learned to act my age yet I didn't think it was funny. I was really upset. I was offended. I was like, how dare they after all we've done? But then the next day there was a message from Marine saying, you know, apologies. But also I thought, wow, they actually gave your email address, James, and said that you wanted to hear from people who were upset. So I calmed down, took a deep breath and I wrote a, I hope you'll agree, a polite email to you, um, but saying, you know, I was really upset. And anyway, you know, you rep replied immediately and uh, agreed to my invitation uh, to come and join us on the pod. So 
I think let's start with perhaps you'd like to say about your perspective of, of, of all of that and that tweet. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I think the first thing I'd like to say is just to every single Tottenham Hotspur fan who was offended by the tweet, you know, I, I apologise 100,000%. Um, I can promise everybody that there was absolutely no malice intended whatsoever by the post. Um, you know, it was it shouldn't have gone up. It was taken down uh, after three minutes, but obviously the damage was done and it was it was it was too late. Um, you know, it was bad judgment from a, a young social media volunteer who thought he was he was uh, creating a laugh um, when it was bad judgment. It was bad taste. It was bad timing. Um, the guys, uh, you know, he's, he's he's devastated about what's happened since. He, as I say, he realised his mistake straight away and 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 took it and took it down and really, you know, spent the last probably seven weeks just trying to protect him really. And that's why I put my email out just so that any criticism really came my way, not his. Um, and ultimately, I've had I've had lots of emails from uh, Tottenham fans, not not all negative, not all criticism, um, but the ones that have been critical. I've quite rightly said, you know, we've given you all this money as a football club and now you put this tweet up which shows us a complete lack of respect. And I get it, you know, I can't argue with that. But all I would say is that, you know, the, the, the feelings that people have at Marine now towards Tottenham Hotspur, the respect couldn't be higher. You know, you guys have completely turned us around as a football club from what we've ever been and given us a foundation to grow for the next 10, 15 years plus. So the respect, as I say, is it's, it's a heartfelt, really, apology. Um, it shouldn't have happened, um, it won't happen again, and hopefully it hasn't tarnished really the, the great bond that has been built between the clubs. Yeah, thank you, James. And, and I have to say also, when I received your email, it really made me think um, uh, how glad I was, first of all, that I didn't respond to the, the tweet. I, I, would, I would never do that anyway. <laughs> but, you know, I suppose I was feeling angry at some anonymous um, person. And then when you said, you know, how devastated he was feeling, I, it really made me think this isn't an anonymous person. This is a young lad learning his job, doing his best, trying to really sort of go the extra mile and come up with something witty. And yeah, he's made a, it wasn't appropriate, but he'll have learned. And I really hope that he'll have a great um, career moving forward. Um, and I'm sure you're supporting him really well. That's great. Thanks, Rich. Then you're right. And, and, and ultimately, you know, I look at myself and think, you know, what could I have done better? You know, I've put, ultimately put himself in a position where he's put a tweet out and it hasn't gone down well for obvious reasons. Um, I think, you know, it's not an excuse. I think, you know, the fact that we are a, a small club, if you like, um, we, ha we haven't got the same procedures in place. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve for us all in the future. It's a learning curve for him, definitely. It's a learning curve for me. We learn as a football club, but as I say, there was no mal malice towards Tottenham Hotspur and what Tottenham have done for us, we'll never ever forget as long as we live. Brilliant. Thanks, James. That was really good. I, I, I must say that that whole exchange is really funny because, I, James, you all have no idea, no idea about this, but Rachel up until very recently was a headmistress. <laughs> and it, it did feel very much like um, you were, you were called up to see the headmistress then. <laughs> I, I actually, I found the post really amusing, I've got to say. And and, and um, I'm a photographer and the only my only negativity about it was the Photoshop was absolutely rubbish. So that's all I'll say about it. I, 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 can I just say, Rob, as well, I, I, um, I work in comms, James, and uh, so I, I saw that and I laughed and I, and I thought there'll be some that will, will cause offence. And I would say to any Spurs fans, if anyone is still offended by it, just take it in the spirit it was intended because it was, it was a funny post. And, you know, I've been in a position where, you know, as in my department, somebody sends something out that they think is amusing and, and maybe just haven't seen it from the other side, aren't aware of what's gone on. But one person I do have to mention and is, is Tom Clark, who did... The social media on the day and he was absolutely brilliant the social media coverage by your team on the day of the game and i, I sent a tweet out and uh, mm. and said well done from one person who works in comms to another he was absolutely spot on the tweets were absolutely brilliant and funny it, the right tone hit all the way along um so uh, you know while, while we're talking about that tweet, we should also talk about the tweets during the match, which were brilliant and yeah. and probably more entertaining than the game in some. Oh, was, they were. They were fantastic. Brilliant. The tweets, I loved it. I was like literally liking all of them. So, yeah, great. No, that's great. Thanks, Mark. No, he's a great guy. As I say, he's been with us probably about eighteen months now. Um, he's a great guy, and he's hopefully got a great, great, a great future within within that field. Absolutely, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, can you can you just? Uh, I'm, I'm also. Um, 
Well, I'm a Spurs season ticket holder also. I'm a Haringey Borough season ticket holder who are sort of similar, well, um, similar sort of situation, I guess, to yours. Just just give us a little insight, really, as to generally what it's been like as, you know, a CEO trying to run a club during the pandemic, not necessarily to do with the FA Cup, but just a sort of real brief overview would be brilliant. Yeah, so forgetting about the FA Cup, so prior to probably uh, October, November, it was really, really tough. You know, the income completely dried up. Um, you've still got a lot of the same of the same costs you had before. Um, so it was a really, really tough time for us. Um, off the pitch, we had our challenges. You know, you're looking, you know, are we going to get to the end of the season like a lot of clubs at our level were? Um, and then on the pitch, you know, we, we, we brought in a manager, Neil Young, um, who I'm sure you all know by now, a couple of years ago. He's done an absolutely brilliant job. He's a, he's a really top manager. And the last two years, both seasons, we've been in the playoffs hoping for promotion. And both seasons have ended uh, abruptly because of coronavirus. So all that work, all that preparation you put into bringing players in, into to really trying to strive to to move upwards and push on uh, and it's really been uh, again aside from the FA Cup run it's been a waste of time and and you know it's not just us it's every club in that same situation that you know people do put a lot of effort into everything we do at non-league level you know I'm a volunteer everybody evol- everybody's volunteers and to, to, to have done so much and then for everything to just get cancelled halfway through it's really really frustrating but I guess at times like this you've just got to sort of look at the bigger picture and say you know with all the um the disaster around the world and you know the people uh challenges with COVID you know we're, we're lucky but it's been a situation we are where we can keep going where, where there's other clubs that aren't so fort- fortunate um and then, yeah yeah Yes, absolutely. Um, so obviously going back to the FA Cup, which was such a season changer, game changer um, completely. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about sort of where were you? Were you all, well, I'm, I'm assuming you weren't all together, but um, where were you when you heard? What happened? What was the first thing you did? Yeah, well, I mean, the draw was really interesting. I mean, we've only ever got in 126 year history, we've only ever got to the third round proper uh, once, and that was in 1993. Now, at that time, there were three non-league clubs left in the draw for the third round. There was Marlow, there was Yeovil Town, and there was Marine. Now, Spurs, as, as you'll probably know, got drawn against Marlow. Um, Yeovil Town were drawn against Arsenal. And then we got Crew Alexandra away. So we really got the, uh, no offence to Crew Alexandra, that we really got the tough end of the bargain. So I think, you know, we were really hoping to just get one of the big boys, you know, a Tottenham or an Everton or Liverpool. Um, so we were excited by it. We were actually, you probably remember that the third round draw was actually uh, took place at Marine, Fo- Marine itself. And we were the other side of the wall compared to where the draw was onto the main stand. Um, so Niall and, and the manager, Neil Young, were out sort of the other side and we were sort of sat there, a few of the board members just watching on the TV. Um, and all of a sudden there was this almighty shout from outside. And we knew that we must have been about a minute behind. So we knew it was big, <laughs> Niall Cummins. I, I, we could hear him running around and, and screaming. So we knew it was a big draw, but we didn't know who it was against. And then, you know, obviously, Marine came out. We knew we were at home. And then next minute, Spurs came out. And, it, you know, the people in the room just started screaming. Um, and then there's sort of, there was a bit of a lull and a pause as you sort of take it in, what it means. You know, at the time, Tottenham were top of the league. And, you know, you think about Mourinho coming to, to Marine. It was just an unbelievable moment. And as soon as that realisation hit him, there was another round of screams. So it was just one of them, you know, really magical, uh, magical times and really a moment that we will never, ever forget. Yeah. And then obviously the players, what, what about the players? Were they all on a WhatsApp group together or were they to? And how, how did they find out and what did they... Yeah, did they... I mean, the players, I mean, obviously with the challenge of COVID, everyone's separate. I mean, as soon as a draw happened, everything just turned crazy and it got progressively crazy towards the match but you know even the next morning for example I went down to the club and there were Spurs fans at the ground you know looking through the railings seeing where they were going to be playing so we'd sort of open the gates for them they'd have a walk around and we'd have a give them a little bit of a tour uh, and people just wanted to be there it was one of them games that, that doesn't come about too often um, I mean the players themselves obviously they were amazed they were excited there was a lot of uh, banter between them joking about how you know, they were going to keep Harry, Harry Kane in the back pocket, you know, but fully know it, fully, fully knowing that we, we were going to get an absolute hammering. So the players were, as I say, they, they were just so excited and um, they've never been so nervous. I think they would all admit that. Um, but, you know, to be on a pitch with the likes of 
Gareth Bale. It's just something that, as I say, as a player at non-league level that, that you want to aspire to. And we were the envy of non-league, uh, without a doubt. Absolutely. Oh, brilliant. It, it's uh, One thing I have to say about the stadium, We when we saw the draw, my, my I've got three boys and my 16 year old was we obviously was desperate we were like if we if can we go if we can go can we go and, and one of the things that they were saying when we were watching the game they were like when this is all over dad we've got to go to a marine game we've just got to go I want to be in that stadium because it's got an aura now hasn't it just the you know getting the ball from number 23 and all that it's just <laughs> it just looks amazing um so it's, it's it's like a proper old school stadium so I think you'll have a few more Spurs fans turning up when all this madness is over Cheers, but man. in terms of the draw you know you, you knew immediately did you know immediately this this match would be behind closed doors or were you hoping at that point that you might be able to allow fans in no we didn't is, is, is the answer and uh, we knew there was going to be a government announcement in a couple of weeks time we didn't know what that was going to be necessarily Liverpool at the time um, was one of the first ones to get the the rapid mass te- testing done so our our rates as they call it had dropped massively and, and our case had dropped massively so we were hoping that for our area we'd, we'd get away with it and um, so you know we did it. the biggest worry we actually had was that the FA were going to uh, forced the game to be behind closed doors because of how restricted it was with the TV um, companies, etc. So we had lots of FA people come down to take surveys of the ground um, and they basically gave us a COVID attendance that we were allowed for the game. So our capacity is just over 3,000, but they basically told us that for the game, we were allowed between 550 and 600. So that's what we're working towards and we're having lots of conversations probably daily and uh, we had lots of meetings in terms of you know, we, we had thousands of people asking for tickets from sponsors to, to fans. How do how, you choose? You know, it's not, it's not yeah. like, for example, at Spurs where you've got ticket systems where you know exactly who's been to lots of games, etc. over the past couple of years. We just don't have that for us. You know, people go to the turnstile and they, they put a £10 note on the uh, on the thing and walk in. So we haven't, you know, we had lots of conversations. As I say, we, we were really trying to do it the fairest way possible. Um, I'd set up a sportsman's dinner. Um, that was going to be on the Thursday before before the game. We had a pre-match hospitality uh, that was lined up for the morning of the game. Um, you know, we'd allocated 50 tickets, for example, for sponsors' tickets, and all of them tickets uh, that the sponsors the sponsors obviously wanted match entrance and uh, match entry. Um, so we we, that, we were going to make about 45,000 as as an example from them sponsorship packages. So all of a sudden, when it was announced that we were going to have to be behind closed doors, it just hit us like a ton of bricks, really. You know, we had, we had fans who had been supporting, you know, we might only be a small club, but we've got some loyal fans who have been supporting Marine for 40, 50, 60 years, That's who have been to almost all, all home games, m- most away games as well, and all of a sudden couldn't go to the biggest game in the history. And then on the, the other side, you've got the sponsorship, where people really, as I say, only really wanted the sponsorship tickets because they wanted the entries to the match. And as soon as that was stopped, uh, they pulled out. So it brought a lot of challenges and it brought a lot of upset. And that really was probably what instigated the the virtual ticket raffle that, that we decided to start. Yeah, so just jump in there a second, James. Yeah, where, where did you, like all of this information, you're, you're obviously your volunteers, like we're volunteers. So you, you sort of bring a spell, you must have had to bring yourself up to speed really, really quickly. and. Were you phoning other clubs, um, just asking what they'd done in similar situations? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, so uh, I was in touch with Tottenham, Simon Bamber, commercial director. I spoke to quite a lot. Richard, our secretary, was uh, in touch with, with your secretary. I've got to say, both of them absolutely fantastic. Couldn't help us enough. Um, I was speaking to Everton, to Liverpool, to Lincoln, uh, Chief Executive of Lincoln City, it was so, and it was one of them games, and I'll probably refer to it later again, but it was just one of them games where everyone just seemed to want to help out. You know, everyone just seemed to want to help, no matter who it was, everyone knew the situation, and that was what really got us through it, really, the fact that we could, could call on. You know, COVID particularly was a big challenge because, you know, we went from having uh, no, no um, in terms of things we had to do and comply with, you know, our ground had to be COVID compliant as, as it could be. But in terms of the players, there was no testing. But obviously that completely changes when you become an inverted commas elite club. And for the FA Cup, for example, and then we went into a position where the players were having to, to test twice in the week before the game. And it was a completely different um, experience towards that end of the FA Cup than the start. 
you know, at the start of the FA Cup, we were just keeping our fingers crossed that we didn't get any players with COVID because at that stage, if any clubs got a player with COVID, they kicked you out the FA Cup or or you'd be lucky if they didn't. And there were probably about 30 clubs altogether that got kicked out. So every time the manager rang and, and I saw it was him, I was panicking in case he was ringing to tell me that a player got COVID. And ultimately, if that had happened, um, we, I wouldn't be sat here now. Um, and, and it was difficult to sort of do anything about it because it's not like we're a, pre- a professional club where we can tell players to stay within bubbles or not to go out. You know, the reality is we've got players who work in the NH- NHS. We've got a, our centre half works in the COVID ward at Liverpool Hospital, and uh, we've got uh, a teacher. So we've got all these players in different work environments. You know, they can't take four weeks off work, for example, before the game to try and stay isolated. So we just had to manage it um, as as good as good as we can, and thankfully. Uh, we came out of it unscathed, but as I say, the, the actual help that we got from clubs up and down the country was absolutely fantastic. That's, that's just incredible. Yeah. yeah, it all seemed to be managed so well by yourselves. And one one last thing I wanted to ask before we move on to the next question was, obviously, we saw the Spurs bus, the Spurs coach arriving and the, the excitement in the street and the excitement within the club with the draw. I mean, for you personally, like you say, you've got fans there who've, who've been Marine fans for, for decades and this is probably the biggest game they would have seen. I mean, how did you feel when you knew it was going to be played behind closed doors? I mean, it must have been, I mean, for us as Spurs fans, we were like, oh, you know, it's another away game we're missing and we're gutted. But but for you guys, I mean, and for you in particular, you know, volunteer within the club, it must have been really, really hard to to deal with that that news. Yeah, and, and for me, it was seeing other fans who, I mean, I've been, I'm 35 now, so for 35 years of my life, I've been a Marine. I was I was dragged as a child by my dad, who's obviously, my dad who's chairman, and it's been part of my blood, and a lot of people have looked and said, you know, why do you follow, they've got Everton Liverpool, uh, you know, on the doorstep, why do you, uh, why do you follow a Marine? And it's just one of them clubs that, you know, when you get involved, people realise it just sort of grabs you, and people stay involved uh, forever, so... I've known a lot of Marine fans for a lot, a lot of time. You know, a lot of them are good friends that I've known for years and years and years and years. So to see them um, be in a position where they weren't going to be allowed into the game, that was really, that was the most upsetting thing. I mean, we, there was grown men, you know, cry, coming to the club crying because they weren't going to get in. The, the game was that, mag, you know, that that bigger magnitude for us. Yeah. Um, that that was the real heart wrenching thing. Just the fact that they they just couldn't come. Um, but it was just something they had to, had to live with and ultimately we had to get on with as well. Yeah, it's a massive blow to the to the club that you weren't able to sort of have your fans there to watch such a big occasion. Um, but you did respond quite well with the um, the virtual tickets. I thought that was absolutely amazing, like a really incredible creative way of, of, of um, generating obviously some revenue and also just getting people involved. Um, and we, we as a trust were really, really delighted to support the initiative. Um, could you talk us through like the different ways in which the Spurs fans and the football community were able to get on board with that support? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there was there was tons of things. Honestly, I mean, I could, I could go on all day. I think a few of the highlights for me, one, one, one of the virtual tickets, you know, we sold 32,202 tickets to the match. You know, that really was driven by largely by Spurs fans. It was it was unbelievable. And um, when, I, when I launched the scheme, I was hoping to sell 550 to 600 tickets to fill the gap of the, the people who couldn't attend the game and then within a few hours we were at, at that 600 target um, and then you know soon after that we'd, we'd uh, sold out our, our grounds of 3,000 tickets um, a, a couple of days after that we'd sold 6,000 which is our highest ever attendance against Nigerian national team in 1949 um, and then soon after that, we hit 10,000 and then it just kept going up. And I think of the morning of the game, I think we'd sold about 15,000. Um, and then it just, as I say, that the attention we got on the day of the game and it just kept going up and up and up and up. And a ticket company kept texting me every every hour with an update of how many we'd sold. Uh, and it was just incredible. And then it was mentioned on BBC um, and the ticketing company. So when it was mentioned on BBC, the numbers on their site was they were the official uh, London Olympic 2012 uh, ticket ticketing company online ticketing company and they remember for that the tickets came on sale all of a sudden and he said when it was mentioned on BBC he said it well outweighed anything that happened for the London Olympic Games so it was just it was just one of them unbelievable moments as I say and then to get to 32,000 was just I, I can't put it to words into words what it means to us as a football club. 
Um, and as I say, it was just unbelievable. But beyond the virtual tickets, there was tons of other um, ways people got involved. There was a, a North North American um, fan club, Cartilage Free Captain. I don't know if you yes. know them, but they basically yeah. Yeah, sponsored back of shorts. They gave us over $10,000, which was all donations from their fan club. Um, there was a Tottenham fan called, called, called Matt Bridal. He set up a GoFundMe page that raised over £10,000 as well. Um, in terms of scarves, there was over 1,500 scarves sold. There was um, over 4,000 programmes sold. Um, we're waiting for the numbers on the kit sales, but we think about 500 were sold through the online Macron store. Um, and then, you know, you go into things like Tottenham, Tottenham's Community Trust, the Community Foundation. And Gary Mabbert came in and did some virtual deliveries to some of our elderly and vulnerable people within the local area that we deliver to. So, as I say, it just didn't stop and didn't stop. And as I say, I cannot thank the people of Spurs enough. It was absolutely unbelievable. And, and to be fair, the wider, the wider football world was yeah. as well. I mean, you know, I look at people like Jamie Carragher, who stepped in and sponsored the dugout. Um, you know, I, I, I had a conversation with him about potentially doing a match sponsorship, and then he agreed to go to go one higher and, and do the dugouts, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, Everton and Liverpool, you know, the day the, in the week leading up to the Tottenham game, when that government announcement was made, basically all the local facilities, three G facilities and grass pitches, all closed. Um, so we were due to have a training on the Thursday night and the, the day before the game, the Saturday. So when all the, the, the places were closed, our two training sessions were cancelled. So I had to sort of ring up Everton and Liverpool as last resort. Uh, and straight away, they, they allowed us to come into their, um, to their training grounds for us to train on Thursday night at Everton and the Saturday at, at Anfield. So the list goes on, honestly. I mean, we got phone calls from people, you know, we never knew it existed. And there's one guy um, who rang up the club and he said, I'm, I'm, my name's George. He said, I want to make a donation to the club. Um, so we said, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. And he said, yeah, he said, my name is George Davis. He said, if you Google my name, he said, I was the founder of George Asda. And he said, <laughs> he said, and I, I created the next. And he gave us a, he gave us a fantastic donation. And then he also produced for us our half and half, half and half scarves um, and oh, sold our cool. programs online through his online website. So mm-hmm. as I say, it was just one of them, you know, sometimes football get, gets criticised. But for me, this is one of them games where the whole of football came together to just to deliver just a what I thought was a brilliant spectacle. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, well, keep saying it. <laughs> it, it was amazing. I, I thought the, um, you know, I mean, the third, third round of the Epic Cup is, is an incredible day anyway, in my mind. And and it was, mm. I think, right in the middle of this pandemic, it was incredible just to have, it's all those sort of familiar, familiar, um, the sort of reminiscence things that come back to people and all of the, you know, and, and we were creating, well, Marine were creating history, Tottenham were creating history, and that will be shown, those clips of the game and the virtual, people will be talking about the virtual tickets, all of this thing for decades to come, which illustrates to me that it's all p- positive power of sport, which I bang on about all the time. Um, to go back to, sorry, just go back to, to the, the nuts and bolts of it. Do you, have you got any idea of how much money was was raised? Because unfortunately, that is the you know the thing that keeps the ball rolling, so to speak. So yeah, just yeah, we, we we raised over half a million, um, which was just unbelievable. I mean that you know since as long as I've been involved in the football club, we've never had more than twenty, thirty thousand in the bank. To be, to be completely honest, yeah. so to have that sum of money, it's just a complete game changer for us. Um, your relationship with your bank managers have changed slightly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for a change, yeah, for a change. Um, but, you know, as I say, it's just been a game changer. We, we actually, I, I, I joined as CEO last last year. Um, you know, so Seth, the first thing I did was in the summer, put a five-year plan together. So, you know, from where we are now, how can we move fo- forward as a football club? Um, you know, what can we do to improve us on the field? What can we do to improve us off the field? Um, and ultimately, with that five-year plan came cost. So what that's now, what that money will now allow us to do is really accelerate that plan, really speed things forward. You know, we're looking at in, in putting a 4G pitch in uh, this summer. Uh, we're looking to completely renovate the two uh, function suites. One of them, obviously, the the Tottenham uh, players got changed in, uh, but it will completely change the whole club uh, from what it was before from a revenue perspective and it will just give us that real base and the real platform to build over the coming years and you know what what we've what we've said for the past you know couple of months since since the the Tottenham draw was announced was you know we want Tottenham fans have done this for us we want Tottenham fans to become part of that journey you know the success that we hopefully will have over the next few years you know we want them to share that with us and 
as I say, as, as, as that's why, you know, not to mention it again, but that's why I hope that the, the post didn't tarnish everything that really we've, we've built over a, a long period of time. As Rachel's, you know, we're fine with it. It's Rachel. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm almost, I, I think I'm over it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, could you just tell us a little bit about the day? Whether, you know, I mean, obviously um, you'd all worked so hard for it. The players passed their COVID tests. It all went ahead. It was chosen for match of the day or, you know, for the live BBC coverage. What was it like? And one thing I do want to know is, did the BBC pundits, Gary Lineker in particular, did he dig in and uh, get a virtual ticket? He bought 10. He bought 10. They all, they, they all did. They all bought one. He actually bought 10, which was was amazing. Um, yeah, and 10, I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, obviously, you're looking at a team in, in, in Tier 8 against a a team, you know, one of the biggest clubs in 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 the world. Well, in in England, and not the world. Um, yeah. So it's <laughs> you know the world got it right the first time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just it was just incredible. And in terms of the preparations, you know, the manager was, you know, one of the things that the reason we've got to this stage ultimately is because the manager prepares so well for games. He really did everything with the players to try and to try and prepare them. Um, I think he was quite net. He was excited, obviously. I think when the draw came out, he was quite taken aback, really, in terms of what we'd achieved. And then I think he was quite sort of turned into the game, quite nervous in terms of, you know, how the hell am I going to sort of deal with that without making it without without making it a bit and turn into a bit of a cricket score. So, you know, from his perspective, we we did everything we can to try and be as competitive as possible um, in terms of the match. Um, but I know, you know. It's it's difficult to do that when I think after the the draw I think you put you drew three all in a game in Europe, um and he told me that you know he started to write notes and he paused every time he wanted to write something after eight minutes he'd had about ten pages of paper filled, he said and then he gave up, um and then you look at you know just after that you played Arsenal beaten two 0 and I think Kane and and Son both scored scored and you know he, had, he was in an interview and he was asked how just sort of how just stop them too and he said well if Arsenal can't we've got absolutely no chance. So it's, it's to, to go from to go from that to really trying to put on a, a display um, was really what we were looking to try and do. So all the preparations were geared towards that. You know, we from an overnight stop point of view, we've only ever had one in the last before this FA Cup run. We'd only ever had one overnight stop in the last 25 years, um, which was a few years ago away to Dover in the FA Trophy. So we, we going back to the preparation, we, we we did an overnight stop in a in a local Liverpool hotel. Um, we went. We had a meal the night before. Um, players were in bed by quarter to nine, um, and then obviously next morning we I sort of darted across the marine to sort of soak up the atmosphere. And there was literally thousands of people just passing right through the day of the game. Not just marine fans, but there were Tottenham fans again just coming to take photographs to just soak up the atmosphere. And um, we put a sign at the front of the stadium to say we welcome Tottenham Hotspur on the 10th of Jan. Um, so everyone, all the fans were sort of getting photographs in front of that. And as I say, just as memories for the game. So I spent probably a few hours there um, and then headed back into into Liverpool to get the team bus back. Um, and, you know, that was just a crazy experience. I mean, we were led by police, police, police vans, police bikes, which might be a normal thing to, to Premier League clubs. But to us, it was just like a complete, you know, strange concept. And, you know, you, I was sat at the front of the coach just thinking, you know, this is the real deal. This is really what it's about. Um, and then as we neared the ground, you know, the sort of the more and more people as, as we went just lying in the streets. It's only from the centre of Liverpool to where Marines ground is. It's literally one straight road. And then you turn off down College Road where Marine's ground is. So that whole way, as we sort of progressed towards Marine, there were gradually more people just waving us by and things like that. And then as soon as we turned into College Road where the ground is, you just saw thousands of people lying on both sides of the street. And I'm not one to really get emotional, but that was probably the first time in my life I, I, I was I was crying at the front of the bus. Just couldn't believe the amount of people that come to line us and see us arrive. And obviously they come to see uh, Tottenham arrive as well, but it was just such a, a a crazy moment, and had to sort of get myself together for when we got off the bus. Um, so then it just went on from there. We Tottenham players arrived about five ten minutes later, and you see obviously likes of the Mourinho's and the the Bales getting off, and, and I'll say there were big big crowds outside that I know I think that got a bit a bit of criticism just in terms of everything's going on with coronavirus, but 
Um, everyone just was desperate to see Tottenham, Tottenham coming to Crosby. Um, so the players went in. Uh, I went past the manager's office about five minutes later and he sort of was walking out. I said, are you OK, Neil? He said, yeah, he looked a bit nervous. He said, I'm just, I've just been summoned by Jose. So he sort of toddled off for a, a meeting with Jose. He was gone for about 30 minutes. Um, and he, he said Jose was just a complete class act. You know, not just Jose. I'll, I'll come on to the players in a second. But, you know, they just treated us with complete and utter respect. And uh, Jose gave Neil a dossier that thick of all the preparation they'd done for the game, uh, all the work. And it was clear that they had, Tottenham had 100% prepared for this game as if it was a normal Premier League game. You know, there was full respect to us. So, um, and it was the same with the players, you know, people like Ben Davis, um, Joe Hart stands out in particular as, as you know, the way the way, but the way every every player spoke to the players. As I say, there was no talking down or, you know, I'm Premier League and you're Tier 8. There was just, as I say, complete uh, respect and our players will never, ever, ever forget it. Um, so that was, that was that. And then obviously in, in terms of the game itself, uh, Neil Kegney's, Crossbar uh, was probably moments of our game. Um, you know, I mean, about actually the last two years, I've been looking at doing a crossbar competition at half time at Marine, and I finally got my moment. I think I'm going to call it the Kenji crossbar um, and try and get fans to hit it. But anyway, that's a separate that's a separate conversation. Um, so yeah, so and then after that, I think I think the only disappointment from Neil's side was that the, the, the two goals we conceded first were, were probably quite sloppy. It was frustrating. We'd we'd held on for 20 minutes, which is what Neil said to the players before the game he wanted to do, and then see where the game took us. But to concede then two goals in such quick succession and they were probably two of the sloppy goals to the sloppiest goals um was a bit disappointing but as I say in the scheme of it you know at half time I was pretty concerned that it was going to turn into a nine or ten nil and, and sort of become a bit demoralizing but you know we kept battling away second half and I think hopefully the five the five nil was quite a, a respectable respectable score and then I guess after the game you know we we sort of um we saw the Tottenham players, I think, were, were there for about 10, 15 minutes after and then and then sort of shot off. I know that the, the idea was that they didn't shower at the um, at the stadium. They went back to the hotel to get a shower. But I know that Son was the only exception. Um, I believe that he went he went to get a shower. And when when you go to get a shower at our place, you pretty much go next to the, out, next to the outside. And it was a freezing cold day. So I think he sort of trundled along, went into the shower. It probably wasn't as warm as he's used to it. At Tottenham Hotspur, so I think he got a bit of a fright, and our captain opened the door, and all he saw was a half-naked son walking past him, <laughs> screaming, screaming, screaming about how, how cold it was. Amazing. So yeah, so it was it was it was unbelievable. Just things like that, you see, it just um, as I say, it's just once in a lifetime for us. And then we sort of retired into the um, Arriva Suite where you guys had been getting changed. Uh, you guys had just gone, um, and I think again, talk about the stark contrast between the two clubs. You know, when, when we go to an away game, our kit manager literally picks up a bag with a kit in and goes into the away changing room. And when we walked into the Areva suite, there was literally probably about 30, you know, big, big boxes just full of kit. So, and all of us were just absolutely gobsmacked by it. There was two guys, two kit men who were there for about three and a half hours um, clearing it all away afterwards. And it just sort of brings home, you just don't realise the amount that goes on at, at the Premier League level. Um, and that was pretty much it. We had, we had a, a few sort of quiet drinks before everyone sort of dispersed. Um, and, and that was it. But I say it was just a magical day, really. And I think I was asleep by about probably about half 10, 11 o'clock, just exhausted from, from everything that had just happened. Wow. Oh, thank you for those amazing insights. That's just yeah. incredible. And also, just to put the score in context, we, we won away at United 5-1. <laughs> <laughs> Six oh, one. Yeah, I forgot about that. Six <laughs> one, Rachel. Six one. Was it? it was six. six one. <laughs> same aggregate. Same aggregate score. Aggregate. Yes, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing, really. Um, so yeah, we we um we sort of been lucky or unlucky this season to well, I think so. I think as a supporters trust, we we've shown tonight. We you know football football for us is is really important, and it's it's sort of important at all levels. It's important to support the football pyramid without wanting to appear at all patronising. Mm. We had the opportunity when our game was cancelled late in Orient, obviously, when our Car Carabao Cup match was cancelled because of COVID, um, and fans sort of reached out then. And it was actually, I think you you said quite rightly in this, it wasn't just Tottenham fans, it was football fans in general. And you start to appreciate what football means to people. Um, and and um, 
So, you know, one really good thing about all this is that it's given us, hopefully, uh, a chance to build great positive links with Marine. Um, and I know that you extended, well, Marine extended uh, invitation to Spurs fans, which well, obviously we'd all love to take you up on it. I, I actually I just reminded as we were speaking about three seasons ago, I cycled up to Liverpool for, to Everton for the first game of the season with two mates. Um, but I'm not going to cycle up to Marine. I'm just telling you that. But I think we'll all come and visit you. Can you just remind us what the, the offer was for Spurs fans? Um, yeah. That yes, managed to make it up to you. Basically, every every Spurs season take holder can have free entry uh, to Marine for a game. So if, for example, Everton, Liverpool, you, you know, you've got a game against them on a Sunday, it might be uh, uh, hopefully uh, the possibility that, that you guys can come down on the, the day before. Um, or even sort of the United City were only probably just about 50 minutes away from Old Trafford and, and, and City's ground. So, yeah, what we're, we've invited all, all, all Tottenham Hotspur fans uh, to the ground next year. You know, if you come, make yourself make yourself known. Come, come and, as I say, come and speak to us. We'll normally be in the, the bar before the game and bar after the game as well. <laughs> for, us, for us, it's not just about, you know, watching the football between three and quarter to five, although hopefully that will be enjoyable. It's about, you know, getting to know each other and really just create, keeping that lasting bond through to many years into the future. Wonderful stuff. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I'll definitely be in the bar, James, before and after the game. No, <laughs> like get, me, get me in any pub or any bar anywhere. But, uh, but in particular, I, the, as I said earlier, the, the thought of getting in see Marine Stadium, I just, I just love the look of the ground. It's a proper old school ground and uh, I can't wait, to, can't wait to be up there. One thing um, we should say as well is just to the players, the, the performance was phenomenal. And yeah. just to... To say to you, James, I think you know, what what you guys have done really captured the imagination because the, the virtual tickets it gave us a chance to interact with the club as well. You know, but we were doing that. My my son came in. He's like, "Have you seen Marina selling virtual tickets and a raffle?" And I was like, "Yeah, my son's 16, 17. And he said, "Well, if you win, Dad, to be um, manager for the day for preseason friendly, you can bring me on at half time." I'm like, "Okay, you know." So, <laughs> so there are all these conversations probably going on in every lounge of every Spurs fan, but it, it works so well. So hats off to you guys for doing it. And obviously, if your dad's watching, James, you can say, "Look, you see, this is what I've achieved for the club." You know, this is all your idea. So, so hats off to you guys. Um, we should again say to you, Jen, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. The anecdotes were absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, it, I think anyone listening to this will probably, if they're driving or watching it, wherever they are, will be will be pulling over and, and laughter at the thought of uh, Son being caught in a very cold shower. So that that is that is worth its weight in gold. So we, we'll maybe put a bit of a Twitter, a bit of a Twitter message out for that. But that, that was brilliant. Um, but look, all that's left for us to do is say thanks to you, James, for joining us. Thanks for giving up your time. James did warn us um, to the viewers who are watching this and aren't listening to it on the podcast that he's in a room in uh, in Manchester and the lights were, uh, he was worried about the lights going off. So they lasted. So I think they dimmed for a bit, but you, you <laughs> stayed in focus. Thanks very much. And uh, as usual, thanks to Anthula, Rob and Rachel. Um, James, once again, thank you. What we will do is we'll, we'll send this out. I'm sure you'll get more messages from many Spurs fans. And uh, when this is all over, hopefully we'll all see you um, up in Marine, up in Crosby very soon. But thank Brilliant. you. Great to talk thank to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks great. so much. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. See you in a bit. Thanks to everyone for joining us um, again on this episode. As we said, if you, if you, if you want to um, find out any more information about um, our AGM, it's all on the website. Um, please have a look, thstofficial.com. Um, scroll back and look at previous... Um, pods and vlogs please stay involved and stay in touch if you have any ideas please get in contact with us um but thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you all soon goodbye <laughs>